I want to welcome everyone once again to Temple Amuna. Um, in, my name is Terry Swartz Russell. Um, I'm one of the members of the Temple Amuna Anti Semitism Task Force. Um, in Hebrew, we have two greetings to welcome folks. We say, Bruchim Habaim, blessed are those who have come, and Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you. There are over 70 of us who have gathered here tonight, and we represent 11 different communities. It's my pleasure to welcome folks from First Parish, Fallen Church, Pilgrim Church, Temple Isaiah, Our Redeemer Episcopal Church, First Church of Christ Scientists, the Muslim American Community of Lexington, the Chinese American Association of Lexington, the Association of Black Citizens, the Sikh Community of Lexington, and members of Temple Amuna. We are thrilled, honored, and humbled by your presence here tonight. The mere step that each of you has taken to enter our bu building and chosen to participate in a program on this very important but very uncomfortable issue of anti-Semitism is huge and extremely meaningful to our Jewish community. So tonight's dinner and program would not have taken place without the support from a special fund here at Temple Amuna, the Phyllis Klein Throat Memorial Fund. This fund was established by Phyllis's family after her untimely death at age 33 in 1986. The fund's purpose is to build bridges and promote better understanding between the Jewish community and its neighbors. How forethought thinking. It, it seeks to accomplish these goals by sponsoring programs such as ours tonight that bring together people from throughout the entire community to examine issues and concerns shared by all regardless of their religion, their background, um, Marty Throat, Phyllis's husband, is with us tonight, and I want to personally thank him for having the foresight to keep Phyllis's memory alive in this way and for supporting tonight's gathering. I would like to now invite Marty to share a few words with you. So please come up. Welcome to Temple of Muna my family's spiritual home since 1980, when Phyllis and I joined the community after the birth of our first child. As Terry alluded to, the unifying theme linking past programs supported by the fund established in memory of Phyllis has been to bring together in this space people from across the general community to address the issues we share in common. Past programs have included grief support, teen driving, and accessing the medical system, to name a few. Tonight's program is at first glance a departure from past programs. Isn't anti-Semitism anti just a Jewish problem? The answer is no. That's why this program grabbed me, and that's why it belongs with all its predecessors. If our society condones anti-Semitism, then we are all in trouble not only because of anti-Semitism's own corrosive effects, but also because sooner or later, everyone in this room risks becoming someone else's other, subject to their own particular anti-fill-in-the-blank-ism and the normalization of its poisons. As Deborah Lipstadt recently said, anti-Semitism is the canary in the coal mine. It may start with the Jews, but it does not end with the Jews. Thank you for being here and honoring Phyllis's memory with your presence. So I just want to thank you, Marty. Um, I just want to mention that tonight it, we are recording the program. It is being live streamed, and we'll send it out afterwards. Um, so we want to welcome anybody that's live streaming uh, with us. Um, I want to invite Rabbi Leora Kling Perkins, Associate Rabbi of Temple Muna, to bring greetings. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much to Terry and to the rest of our Temple Amuna Anti-Semitism Task Force for bringing us here together tonight and for inviting me to speak. It's really such a joy and a pleasure to see all of us together in this space. We Jews are about to begin our holiday of Passover, and that's the holiday that in some ways, is the quintessential story of who we are as a people. We were slaves 
and now we're free. But there's another piece to it. We're told by the rabbis, and many of us will recite this at our Zeders next week, that in every generation, each one of us is obligated to see ourselves as if we personally came out of Egypt. And why is that? Well, the Torah tells us many, many times that we were strangers, and therefore we must love the stranger. Passover is not just about our own experience of adversity and of persecution, but it's about channeling that experience to make sure that nobody else has the same experience. And that's what's so beautiful about us all being here today, that many of us in our own communities, each in our own way, have experienced our own difficulties, our own experiences of persecution, of discrimination, and we come together to help make sure, to help that we all have each other's back. So I want to thank everyone for being here for this very important program and for this really wonderful opportunity to get to know each other across our different communities. Thank you. We're almost there. So I want to start by saying, welcome neighbors. I don't know many of you personally. However, I'm sure our paths have crossed before, maybe in the aisles of Stop and Shop or at Cary Library or during one of those musical performances or back to school nights that when they were held in person at Lexington High School. See, we already have so many things in common. But tonight, we're going to focus on anti-Semitism. Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, President Biden's special envoy, envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, has stated many t times that anti-Semitism has the dubious distinction of being one of the longest, oldest hatreds dating from ancient times, yet the forms it takes keep evolving and is very hard to fight. This century-old scourge of anti-Semitism is experiencing a frightening resurgence. It's on the rise in the United States, and Jews everywhere feel the threat of it. In the Anti-Semitism League's annual report on anti-Semitic incidents, which came out last week, Massachusetts had the sixth most incidents this year across the nation, 152, up from 108 in 2021. The American Jewish Committee survey found that 89% of American Jews and 68% of the general public think anti-Semitism is a problem in the United States. Hate is hate regardless of its origin, and American Jews feel increasingly threatened. Anti-Semitism isn't a Jewish problem. It's society's problem. We invited you here tonight so that we can all learn together what we can do about anti-Semitism. It's time for all of us to take a firm stance against anti-Jewish hate and commit to standing up together whenever anti-Semitism rears its ugly head. I could go on and on. Instead, I want, we want to share with you an eight-minute video uh, from Robert Kraft, the owner of the uh, New England Patriots and a proud Jew, who two days ago on Tuesday launched a campaign, a nationwide campaign called Stand Up to Jewish Hate, a campaign to combat rising anti-Jewish bigotry across the country. He says it's so much better than I. So, um, okay, David, you want to get the lights? The fight against anti-Semitism is sponsored by the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism. Share the blue square and stand up to Jewish hate. Standuptojewishhate.org 
Welcome back. Robert Kraft is best known as the owner of the New England Patriots, but he is also an MVP when it comes to philanthropy. Yeah, Mr. Kraft's donated millions to causes near and dear to his heart. And starting today, he's launching a new campaign to help stop rising anti-Semitism here in the United States. And Harry Smith joins us with more on this important initiative. Harry? You know, it's so interesting because I feel like I've been doing this story over and mm -hmm. over and mm -hmm. over again, and anti-Semitism only continues to rise. Bob Kraft is a guy with a lot of intelligence, and he's got a lot of money. He's begun a campaign the likes of which you've never seen before. If you watch the NFL, you know Bob Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots, frequent holder of Super Bowl trophies. He grew up a local kid, working class. Was your household a religious household? Very traditional. You know, I, I lucked out. We were modest financially, but I had amazing parents who gave great love. I grew up in an observant Jewish home. Early on, Kraft learned a thing or two about uniting people. I went to Brooklyn High School. I got elected president of the senior class, and all the toughest Irish Catholic kids from Brooklyn Village helped get me elected. Myself. He was a kid who went to school on a scholarship. I didn't have a car until I was 25. Yet Kraft laments the loss of our connectedness. We're connected from a technical point of view, but I think there's a loneliness and separation that has developed. I think that's caused a certain divisiveness and in some ways has been very destructive and detrimental to our great way of life here in America. For him, most pointedly, most personally, the rise of anti-Semitism. Multiple gunshots are heard. Eleven innocent lives slain in a house of worship. My holy place has been defiled. I cannot be anti-Semitic if I know where I come from. Drivers were greeted with this anti-Semitic banner. Anti-Semitism is on the rise, and Kraft is determined to help stop it. What's happening now, to me, looks similar to what was going on in Germany in the late 30s. The Jewish people represent 2.4% of the population, but they receive 55% of the hate crimes. That really prompted me to start this new foundation. You wouldn't start it unless you felt you could make a difference. Yes. Can this make a difference? You know, you've got this little field out here. You either win or you lose. Everything I've done, I try to execute and not just talk about things. So in this room, near his office in Gillette Stadium, morning everyone, is the foundation to combat anti-Semitism that tracks and responds to anti-Semitism online. We're monitoring all the things that are being said and come into us by anti-Semitism. Because social media is just filled with this vitriol, with this hatred. People can say anything, yeah. and it's like it's factual, and it takes on its own life. Due to the real-time fashion of the world, we're able to respond to things from the break. And in the end, we're putting out content to really educate those who are unaware of what's happening online. Soon you begin to see this symbol on social media. A blue square with a hashtag and ads like this. percent square is what the U.S. Jewish population is. On its own, it can't make a dent in this problem if it doesn't have allies. Join us in this effort of combating anti-Semitism. A 
I'm going to get you one that you can think about what you want to do with it. I know what to do with it. Well, that's really cool. That's not hard. You know, it's a simple sign of we need more bridge building and solidarity together. The Crafts campaign goes beyond social media. Starting today, across all manner of media, important messages. How did you respond? I got chills, almost tears. Yeah. And he had that white paint on his shoe where he painted over the swastika. We're asking that ad for Americans to help. The haters are noisy, violent, aggressive. And the ads are almost the opposite. It's like I'm putting my hand out to you and saying, can't we connect? Connect. Your prayer really inspired us. Connect and have the courage to stand up against hate before it's too late. So at 81, is there a part of you that says, I need to do this now? Yeah, this is a legacy investment. You know, most people like to play between the 40-yard lines and not get roughed up. We're in a situation in the country where this is all red zone material. We gotta go down and but do what's right. And here's one of the other really interesting things that Bob said was, if this continues unchecked the anti-Semitism, it's also really bad for black people and brown people and Asian people and minority after minority after minority. He remembers, you know, he reads his history. Mm -hmm. You look at the beginning of Mein Kampf, everything is blamed on the Jews. And then other groups get ushered into. I didn't say anything when they came for the others. Yeah. That's now it. you just gave me goosebumps. Yeah. yeah. This is so interesting, right? Um, the small blue screen you see on your screen right there, mm -hmm. that small square takes up 2.4% of your TV screen or whatever screen you're on, like the 2.4% of Jews in America. Yet again, they are targets of more than 55% of all religious hate crimes in this country. So. It's time mm -hmm. to stand up, mm -hmm. right? I've got some of these if you I want to uh, say. You can pass those along. And Carson, yeah. I understand uh, this you're gonna This is not my first time wearing this pin, no. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You've responded well, based on the voice. Yes, we've done, you know, we've tried to in prime time on NBC, you know, get behind this and you know the numbers are staggering, they're alarming. Fifty five percent obviously alarming of two point four, but just even if you zoom in even more from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two According to ADL, the Jewish hate crimes were up 36%. So it's, it's, it's an immediate problem. It's a big problem, it's an immediate problem. So this messaging you'll see tonight on The Voice, you'll see that blue box on The Voice, you'll see it on Kelly Clarkson's show, you'll see it on Watch what Happens Live with Andy Cohen, right. and some other people trying right. to get right. the word out. Hey, yeah. that was beautiful. Beautiful story. Thank yeah. you. Oh, watching this power I knew we needed to watch this tonight together. I immediately contacted Mr. Kraft's office and his staff person heading up this initiative dropped off the hashtag blue squares that, I've, that are being passed out this morning at my house at 8 o'clock in the morning. We're passing them around now and hope you will take one, wear it, and explain its significance to others. Um, while these pins are being passed around, I'd like to introduce our featured speaker for tonight and David, turn on the lights. <laughs> you always need a... A husband who's wonderful. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is Reverend Dr. Daniel Jocelyn, I'm going to say it wrong, Simon Kowskowski. Close enough. I want to thank my friend Wendy Lebo from Temple Isaiah for sharing Dan's article with me titled, A National Reckoning of the Soul, a church call to the churches of the United States to confront the crisis of anti-Semitism. We'll send it out to all of you afterwards. After reading this article, I knew Dan would be a wonderful person to address our gathering tonight. So we reached out to him and invited him to be our inaugural speaker for what we hope will be an ongoing series of gatherings among our communities and members. Dan immediately agreed to come speak tonight as he wrote in his email, I believe this is vital work to undertake and would be very glad to serve as your speaker. So a little bit about Dan. Um, Dan is, this is by totally by choice, chance, 
the Kraft Family Professor and Director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning at Boston College. In 2023, he was appointed to serve on the Committee of Ethics on Ethics, Religion, and the Holocaust of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He is a scholar of Jewish-Christian relations and comparative theology and the author of The More Torah, The More Life, a Christian commentary on Mishnah Avot and Christian memories of the Maccabean martyrs, as well as numerous articles. He is also an or a priest ordained in the Episcopal Church. I'd like to invite Dan to speak to us now on what can we do about anti-Semitism. And following Dan's talk, we'll take some questions. Thank you all. It's great to be here. I have a handout. That needs to, has the handout gone around? There you go. We'll get around now. Uh, really honored to be asked by Terry and others to serve tonight. Um, and uh, we, we owe a lot to the Kraft family in eastern Massachusetts for advancing the work of Jewish Christian relations. They, uh, have the, they endowed the Kraft Hyatt chair uh, in this field at Holy Cross. They endowed my chair at Boston College. Uh, they do so much important work in the Jewish community in the greater Boston area, and this, this current campaign is absolutely necessary. So I want to talk about this question of what can we do about anti-Semitism. Um, my own, I, I, I've been in the field of Jewish-Christian relations for 20 years, but over the past five, six years, I've become much more attuned that anti-Semitism has returned. I think there was a lot of complacency in the field of Jewish-Christian relations that we dealt with anti-Semitism, now we're going to deal with advancing further dialogue. But now we have to return back to the problem of anti-Semitism. So what I want to do is I want to first talk about what anti-Semitism is, talk about why it might be rising, how it works, and end with some questions about what maybe we can do in our community. So first, there's a relationship between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. We could define anti-Judaism as religious hatred of Jews, and Christianity is responsible for this. We're entering into Holy Week. I've done a lot of work in my own Episcopal Church tradition to undo some anti-Jewish elements that still linger, especially on the Good Friday liturgy. I know our Redeemer is also doing an excellent series on this right now as well. The key element of Christian anti-Judaism is what we call supersessionism, or replacement theology, which basically is the idea that the Christian church has replaced themselves over the Jewish people as God's chosen. So we could sum up simply in the phrase of a Christian church saying, we are Israel. So all of the promises of the covenant in the Hebrew scriptures are now applied to the church. Conveniently, all the curses still get applied to the Jewish people. Um, I, I could spend hours talking to you about the legacy of Christian anti-Judaism, but I want to acknowledge that as a first problem in our culture. Anti-Semitism emerges in Western Christian culture. You see, especially rising in the 19th century, when the whole phenomenon of, of racial science emerges, the pseudoscience of race, where we get ridiculous terms like Caucasian to describe people. I could talk to you a long time about how the contemporary notion of race is developed in the 19th century. Anti-Semitism as a concept is coined by Wilhelm Marr in the 1870s, to describe specifically racial hatred of Jews. And what he wanted to do is say, our, our, he actually wanted to say, our hatred of Jews isn't religious anymore, it's racial. So anti-Semitism is explicitly aimed at Jews and Judaism on the part of non-Jews, Gentiles. The thing about Christian anti-Judaism is a Jew can always convert, and then the Jew gets to remain Jew. The problem with racial anti-Semitism is a Jew is always a Jew in their essence. And the only solution is to remove the Jew from society. So how would we define anti-Semitism a little bit more? 
The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance uh, uses this definition. It's a pretty common definition that's been adopted uh, along a broad spectrum of institutions. Deborah Lipstadt, uh, President Biden's envoy in anti-Semitism, was involved in the crafting of it. It says this, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. And what are the, what are the different ways of expressing that? It can be rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism, so speech and actions are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish uh, individuals and or their property, towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. So anything that's associated with Judaism is attacked. Synagogues, schools, kosher grocery stores, the list goes on. Because there's a link between Christian anti-Judaism and modern anti-Semitism, I would say this specifically towards people in Christian and Christian-descended communities here, that the first step to dealing with anti-Semitism is to audit your own religious community for bias against Jews and Judaism in terms of language, symbols, and practices. Some of you might know uh, the Reverend Laura Everett, the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Council of Churches. She and I uh, go back, and uh, we actually wrote uh, a, an editorial for the Religion News Service about three years ago about the need for doing an anti-Semitism audit in your religious community. So if you want to Google that, uh, you, you can find that, I think, fairly easily. I would say that other religious communities that are not explicitly Christian that exist in contexts like the United States where Christianity is the dominant culture might also inherit some anti-Semitic attitudes simply by virtue of cultural osmosis. And so there's other ways that other communities might also want to attend to it. But I think there's a special onus and burden on Christian communities. So what are some examples of auditing for anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic language symbols and practices? One is simply pitting Jesus versus Judaism. Jesus was a Jew. His followers were Jews. And here's the other thing. The New Testament is a Jewish text. It's composed by Jews, but then is received as a Christian document later on. So there's an excellent... Um, version of the New Testament called the Jewish Annotated New Testament by Amy Jo Levine and Marks V. Brettler. Some of you probably know Dr. Levine's work in particular. She does an excellent job of laying that out. So what Jesus is arguing with people who look Jewish in the Christian Gospels, it is an intra-Jewish argument. So to pit Jesus versus Judaism makes no sense. It's Jesus as Jew arguing with other Jews. Law versus gospel is the big one, uh, especially if you're in Protestant Christianity. So much of Protestant Christianity coming out of the thinkers of Martin Luther and John Calvin is predicated on opposing freedom in Christ against the burden of the law. And that's due to a particular ring of the Apostle Paul that also needs to get deconstructed and unpacked. And there's been a lot of great scholarship over the past 30 years showing how Paul's arguments are also really internal Jewish arguments making specific kinds of claims. Finally, something like tribalism versus universalism, a way of emphasizing that Jesus welcomed everyone and the religious authorities didn't like it. And that's why he was killed. That's actually an implicitly anti-Jewish statement because it says his Cultural context is, was opposed to welcoming neighbors and strangers and caring for people in the margins. And that is simply untrue about Judaism then and about Judaism today. There's all other kinds of ways we can unpack it. So there's a lot of internal work within your own congregations, if you are in Christian-affiliated communities, to think about. So if we want to deal with anti-Semitism, you have to attend to your own side of the street first, as I say in anti-racism work. 
clean up your side of the street first, and then start making common cause. So what feeds anti-Semitism then inherently is an us versus them mentality. There's us, and then there's outsiders. One of the things I really am trying to work through with Christianity is, why is Christianity so oppositional in the way it thinks? It has a lot of binary oppositional thinking. Because it's born of conflict. Every gospel narrative is a narrative of conflict, about choosing who Jesus is. Most of Paul's letters and the other letters we read in the New Testament are born of internal conflicts in the movements of the early Jesus community. How do we get, and that oppositional thinking, I think, feeds into this creation, the first other, just stated so eloquently before, the first othering of Jews from Christians. And every other form of Christian othering, I'd argue Western othering, is based on that first kind of othering of Jews, that oppositional thinking of us versus them. So in other words, I would say you don't get American racism without first having Christian anti-Judaism. So this also is interlocking work that goes alongside anti-racist work, that goes alongside work for gender equity, that goes alongside work for uh, the dignity of indigenous peoples. But it's all linked together, I think. Okay, so we've heard some of these statistics about rising anti-Semitism in Massachusetts. I was born in Connecticut, did all my adult years here in Massachusetts until 2005. I used to believe that this was like the most liberal, enlightened place in the world. I lived in other places that also appear to be fairly liberal and enlightened today. Travel is good for you. Gives you perspective. But I am shocked at the high rates of anti-Semitic incidents here. Shocked in part because it seems as if the Jewish community in places like eastern Massachusetts is so well integrated into the broader society. As was said there, last year, there were seven, there were uh, this high rate of anti-Semitic incidents, and in Massachusetts last year, 71 cities or towns had at least one incident. 71. I'm not sure how many cities or towns there are in Massachusetts, but, you know. Someone here knows. We're getting, I think, up to over half. I should have done my homework on that one. That's what Wikipedia is for. So let's just talk about, so why is anti-Semitism appearing before us is a thing to ask, and it's not because of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is only a sign of a problem. So let's first talk about this resurgence of white Christian nationalism. Now, I was told that last year the Leica folks had a nice little series on Christian nationalism. So uh, I I'm teaching a course right now at Boston College called Anti-Semitism, Racism, and Christian Nationalism, where we're trying to kind of untangle how all these three things go together. That's where one shows up of racism, anti-Semitism, or Christian nationalism. The other two are not far behind. They are traveling partners. So we need to like unpack a little bit more here. So here's a definition of it from Gorski and Perry's book, The Flag and the Cross, which maybe some of you have read. Very readable, highly, re highly recommend it. Here it is. So America was founded as a Christian nation by white men who are traditional Christians, who based the nation's founding, uh, sorry, I gotta go, who based the nation's founding documents on Christian principles. The United States is blessed by God, which is why it's been so successful. And the nation has a special role to play in God's plan for humanity. But these blessings are threatened by cultural degradation from un-American influences, both out, inside and outside our borders. Gorski and Perry call that kind of the deep story of Christian nationalism. I was raised in this. I was raised as an evangelical in Connecticut, watching the 700 Club. Um, this was part of the narrative I was raised on. I'm also the direct descent on my mother's side from Puritans. I'm from Windsor, Connecticut, the first town in Connecticut. Phelps and Bissells, who got kicked out of Dorchester because they were too conservative in 1633. Imagine that. 
the conservative Puritans. <laughs> That's who I'm from. Let's talk about Massachusetts as a place that establishes the idea of white Christian nationalism. Have you read John Winthrop's a model of Christian charity at some point in your life? The document that he composes in the Arabella anchored out on Boston Harbor. Winthrop is, descent, is part of this Puritan band who are trying to establish their own kind of religious freedom, but just religious freedom from their, for the, themselves. And he writes in it that the establishment that's going to happen in Boston is going to be like a city on a hill that will shine forth to the whole world. Now, we think of this notion of Boston as a city on a hill as part of our humanitarian impulses of welcome. But that's not what he meant, because he said also, we are the new Israel, and if we have crossed our own Red Sea, and we are in our own exodus, and we're coming to our own promised land, and that's going to be bad news for the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag. Because someone needs to leave this land if they're coming. So that sets up manifest destiny. The notion that America is the new Israel, but a Christian version of it. And the Protestant, Anglo-Saxon social order is what determines what this country is going to look like. There's a Puritan version of this, and then there's an Enlightenment Jeffersonian version of this. Just look at the back of your $1 bill. Go to Washington, D.C., the message of the symbolism of the federal government, whether it's the eye of providence that shines out in the back of your dollar bill or the great temple of the U.S. Capitol, is that this is a sacred place well, for a special mission to the rest of the world. So that is what sets up all of our global interventionism in the 20th and 21st century. So there's a deep story in America that this is really a place for a certain kind of people, and everyone else needs to fit into that one way or the other. Now, there's been lots of social movements against that, the civil rights movement. I think what we saw with the BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, are other counter-narratives. But there's a strong and deep narrative that's not just something that only happens in red states. But Massachusetts itself has these deep cultural echoes of a certain place for a certain kind of people. So that sets up, I think, a strong outsider-insider dynamic in a place like Massachusetts, where there's a sense that there's a place for you and a place for others. I think our history of developing strong ethnic identities and enclaves, that certain parts of the city are for certain people and other parts of the city are for other people, and when other folks move into that part of the city, that creates an identity crisis for it. We talk about South Boston. The fact that neo-Nazis show up last year at the St. Patrick's Day Parade with signs that say, keep South the Irish. And the residents of South Boston did not want them to show up, but the Nazis knew that the gentrification of South Boston could be enough of a flashpoint about who belongs in what places that they were hoping they could recruit based off of that. So I argue there's all these anxieties around us in eastern Massachusetts about what areas are for what people and whose identities are being displaced by new people coming in. That I think actually creates a little bit of a fertile soil for recruiting. I'm going to say a little bit about conspiracy theories. Anti-Semitism is inherently based on conspiracy theories. In fact, some scholars argue that conspiracy theories come out of anti-Jewish stories in the Middle Ages that Christians spread, that Jews murdered Christian children and drained them of their blood, mixed into matzah for Passover, which would make no sense. It's an obvious lie. But that's what conspiracy theories are. Outlandish claims that somehow feed a deeper anxiety and drive wedges between people socially. Conspiracy theories inherently are that there is some elite out there that's undermining the social order, and you have to watch out for those elites. Conspiracy theories are thriving in America. 
QAnon, the Great Replacement Theory. You can look those up more. If you look up QAnon, though, don't read too much. Just, it's hard to get out of that one. Um, whenever someone in America says global elites are behind X thing, or the international banking cartel is behind X thing, or George Soros is behind X thing, it's code word for Jews. Every single use, and they, it's a mainstream use in public society now. So here's your first little practice. You hear someone saying, talk about global elites, you need to make an intervention. Just like when you heard someone say something racist or homophobic, as you were learning to perhaps undo some of that from your own conditioning. Why, why are we rife with conspiracy theories? I think it's because we're so alone. We have this deep, deep culture of despair. And conspiracy theories give you a narrative that, however outlandish, unifies everything and allows you to channel all of your anxiety and isolation into something else with shared knowledge that other people have. So we need to find ways to crack that open. So this gets me to my third reason about this, why anti-Semitism. We're having a decline in institutions and a decline in social fragmentations. I'm going to guess each one of your religious communities has seen membership decline over the past 10 years. Or at least just flatline. There's not as many people were there as it used to be. You're wondering what to do with your property that's slowly emptying out. It's okay. Every, it's happening to everyone. It's happening to the Masons also. Right? We have a decline in institutions that leads to social fragmentation. I think the isolation, especially the COVID isolation. I know Lexington is a very still COVID cautious community. Drives isolation even more and more. And I think that's why we're seeing a spike in conspiracy theories now and oppositional thinking and looking for scapegoating is because people have broken a little bit from all that isolation. There's just less glue. And that lets anti-Semitism publicly to emerge more. The id is coming out in a way. So how does anti-Semitism work? It, uh, it's a tool. It's a tool for reinforcing a social hierarchy that privileges what I would say, quote unquote, traditional racial and gender norms in the United States. Some people find real comfort in hierarchies that reinforce a sense of order, especially if they think they are the ones being displaced from the hierarchy. I'm talking about white men, especially white young men. I'm the father of a 16-year-old boy who is white. And the sense that there's less of a future for them. Whether that's right or wrong is something that we need to work with them to sort through. But anti-Semitism can be a tool for helping them think about how do they get back up on the hierarchy that they thought was promised to them. I think this is also why, with gender norms being upset, why in Eastern Massachusetts the Nazis are showing up to drag shows. Drag Queen Story Hour and targeting the trans community is because the acceptance of gender fluidity and gender non-binary categories upsets a deep sense of order for some people. So this is the way in which anti-Semitism, transphobia, homophobia, misogyny, racism, all actually interlocking and intersecting problems. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna address anti-Semitism, that also means we're going to, explicitly or not, be in some kind of allyship with other communities as well. So it might be that in Lexington, to stand up against anti-Semites might mean showing up to defend a drag queen story hour or to protect the gay straight alliance at the high school. That might be where they show up and not here necessarily. I hope they never show up anywhere here. 
but there's the spectrum of the target is wider than we might think. So they're recruiting young white men for the various reasons I just mentioned. And where do they find them? Social media platforms and gaming platforms. So, here, so this is just a little bit like if you're a parent like me, here are some names to watch for if you're working with youth. If you hear youth talk about Nick Fuentes, Andrew Tate, or Joe Rogan, they might be, be exposed to anti-Semitism. They're also being exposed to misogyny and racism and transphobia too. So there's lots of reasons to be concerned. If they are getting into bodybuilding culture or mixed martial arts MMA culture, those are also significant recruiting grounds. And there's some high-risk portals, TikTok. Um, so this connection with bodybuilding, um, I learned through talking to college students. They say if, if young men on TikTok go into bodybuilding streams, there's lots of unfiltered anti-Semitism coming out, and the misogyny, and the transphobia. YouTube, I think we all know about that risk. Um, Discord, if you have a child, a young adult who games a lot, they go into Discord servers, which are chat rooms, to find people to play matches with in their games. And those chat rooms can be recruiting grounds. And then Telegram, which is an encrypted messaging app. So if you discover that Telegram is on your person you care about's phone, that's just like a high-risk environment for being exposed to, to all these things I'm talking about. So those are just like portals and personalities that we might want to be thinking about. Like, how do they get there? So in other words, what I'm telling you is you're probably not seeing it because they're consuming this away from you, right? Because that's what a phone lets you do, <laughs> have this kind of private consumption of media. If only we all just sat around watching TV together as a family. Bring my family values of watching TV together. Okay, so uh, you know our, our time is limited, and I wanted to like, create time for conversation and have the community talk with each other out loud. So just here's here's some strategies for thinking about how to how to talk about anti-Semitism in your community with your community. So again, as I said before, do an audit of your language about Jews, Israel, Hebrew scriptures, slash as Christians would say Old Testament. I think I've covered some of that ground before. There's a couple other things to keep in mind. One is, I'm just going to guess a lot of you operate in some kind of cultural context that's largely progressive, liberal of some way. That's not pejorative. Love liberals. But we need to avoid the fallacy of progress. The idea that pr progress happens naturally. Progress is not inevitable, and progress can be reversed. The inclusion of Jews in Western society is, was a hard-won inclusion, and one that is somewhere between 200 and 100 years old, depending on what country you're talking about. As we saw, with Nazi Germany, easily reversed. Well, more reversible than we would hope. So, you have to not be complacent that wherever victory has been won is a victory that's assured. So communities must remain vigilant about what has already been gained, so it's not lost. We say the same thing about democracy also, by the way. You, maybe you're sitting here thinking, this sounds super political. I didn't think it was going to be this political. Sorry. Like resisting anti-Semitism is, is a political act. Because you're making a judgment claim that others will have to evaluate. And if as communities you want to resist anti-Semitism, something public is going to have to happen eventually. And any claim that has to be publicly evaluated is a political action. So that might be something to just get comfortable with acknowledging. So prepare your community for having difficult conversations. Then. It's a necessary thing. Um, people are redeemable. We wouldn't be actually having this conversation in some ways unless we thought we could actually like, turn the tide of anti-Semitism. Turn the tide of anti-Semitism 
probably doesn't mean for us locking up all anti-Semites or finding them to kingdom come, but hoping that they will change their behavior and stop. And I take inspiration from what Ibram Kendi says in How to Be an Anti-Racist. You know, Ibram Kendi says part of the problem of our conversation about race in America is that when you say someone's an racist, the assumption is made that like, there's something essential about their character that can't be changed, and people feel shame. So they don't want to admit having said something racist. So that means they're racist forever. And that's part of the problem of our cancel culture in a way. Irredeemable. But I argue our communities are communities that believe in redemption. And so part of the conversation has to be not a shaming conversation, but a conversation about habits and dispositions. So what Ibram Kendi says, the good news about racism is it's a habit. It develops out of a habit. And habits can be altered. I'd also, though, add redemption requires repentance. This is something I've learned from my Jewish kin. You are going to change. You actually need to show you change. That doesn't mean, again, a public shaming, but there's a long road to travel. Finally, the work against anti-Semitism is about appealing to moral standards that your community holds. And so you have to be comfortable with publicly talking about your community's moral standards. It's a part of the country that I think rightly highly values the separation of church and state. Uh, coming from Texas, I can tell you this is a good thing. But religion belongs in the public square. The U.S. Constitution is designed for each community to set forth their arguments in the public square so that they can engage with each other. So when you make your stand against anti-Semitism, from your community's context, you need to say, that's coming out of your community's convictions and how and why. That's part of what provides a counter-narrative to the ones being presented. So let me just add, end with a few thoughts here about how to prepare to act against anti-Semitism. First, I would say contact the Anti-Defamation League of New England, which does excellent work around this. I'm sure most of your communities um, have had conversations with your public safety officers. If you are going to do something that's a public counter protest, for instance, you want to be in conversation with them. I would say you need to know what your Jewish neighbors need, or your trans neighbors, or your neighbors of other color or ethnicity. What do they need in that moment? So don't, so one of the things, again, we've learned from our anti racism work don't assume you're going to be the savior be in dialogue with that community that's being targeted and learn what they need and follow their lead. That's why Leica exists, I think. That creates the avenues for those conversations. Again, when you, talk, when you do what you do, say why you're doing it out of your values. If you're not talking about your values publicly, someone else is talking about theirs publicly. So you need to be articulate and like the lovely greetings from Ramadan tonight, to share openly about who we are without that assuming that that's going to create a barrier. But that actually out of that, we're going to be stronger as links of a chain. So from that also, create networks that reach into civic spaces especially schools, because youth are the ones being targeted. Again, I, I think there's appropriate anxiety about religious presence in public schools. I think there's also helpful ways in which communi communities can be engaged with the work of our children in our communities, and not to vacate that space. So invest in youth where they are. I think all of our communities have ways of taking care of our youth in our context, but there's so many youth elsewhere, out there. How are ways that you're going to reach youth who are going to be the most vulnerable and the most targeted for recruitment 
into anti-Semitism. They are lonely. They are scared about so many things. They need you. And so, to wrap this back to the beginning of these ways to prepare, have a plan for responding, because when you become aware it's happening, you will probably have less than 12 hours to respond. What is the Leica fast action response plan? So the work is a lot. <laughs> And the work parallels other kinds of work. So I think a lot of the things I've laid out here are works that slot into other categories of responding for other community needs. Um, and so I think I'm going to leave you with that, and I think we can open up the floor to a conversation. So thank you. Hello, hello. Ah, you're working. Anybody have a comment or a question? For Dan, or just in general? OK. <laughs> I'm sure I see we'll some hands. we got some hands. OK. Speak. You have to speak, hold it really close to your mouth. Thank you so much. I wonder if you, so I'm also an Episcopal priest in a progressive community. And uh, one of the things that progressive really struggle with is this wanting to hold on to Jesus as being the most progressive guy in the room, which, as you say, pits Jesus against Judaism, which mm -hmm. Amy Jill Levine has written about. Yes. I wonder if you could speak to how in progressive Christian spaces there's this, like, psychological need for that mm -hmm. that sort of drives over, you know, historical evidence <laughs> or sort of revised theologies. There just seems to be this need and anxiety that I'm more used to seeing. I grew up conservative also in conservative spaces. So right. it's like interesting to find it in progressive ones. I just wonder if you right. could speak to that. Thank you. I think it's a really important question. Um, yes. Um, why is there a need in progressive Christian spaces to make Jesus, the most progressive person in the room. Which often creates an anti-Jewish dynamic. So I think it's about Christ progressive Christians wanting to respond to conservative Christians. And so they're making conservative Christians into the Jews. Pharisees. This is a, a dynamic that happens a lot in Christian theology where th your enemy takes on Jewish qualities. Um, you see this a lot in the Reformation. Uh, the Protestants and Catholics equally accuse our side of being more Jewish, for instance. So I, I would say progressive Christians need to learn to forgive conservative Christians. Or ask why do I need to differentiate my community? Now, there's some good reasons, some perhaps life-saving reasons to do that. Um, how do you talk about this as a place of welcome without having to compare yourself against somebody else? I think that's a really big Christian dynamic. We're often trying to say how we are the better Christian. I also just want to throw out this little bomb. Jesus isn't progressive. That's our category. I argue, and in my commentary on Mishnovo, <laughs> the more Torah, the more life, I actually argue that Jesus, actually, Matthew 5, where he makes all those, you have heard both taught in Torah, but I say to you, Jesus is offering the more conservative halakhic opinion, the more conservative interpretation of the commandment. He is not a progressive just like he's not conservative. If I may say in the space, Jesus is going to be more than whatever you think Jesus is. At least from a Christian perspective. Okay, another question. Or people can talk to each other too. That's also okay. Yeah. I'm wondering what you think of the idea. Very close. 
Yes. Very close. What do you think of the idea that um, history and uh, people's understanding of history and teaching of history uh, can have something to do with solving the anti-Semitism problem? And when I raise it, I'm thinking about how um, lots of folks who look at Europe today would say that Europe, you know, war is unthinkable in Europe, partly because the German nation has taken on itself the responsibility of owning its great crimes through the ages. It really yes. sets the gold standard for sort of telling the truth on itself. And then a lot of folks who look at um, the American South today would say the opposite problem is is at the root of much of what's uh, m much of the much of the white anger, uh, yeah. which is the lost cause myth and the false teaching of the history of the Civil War and the aftermath that still pervades Southern schools. What would you think of the idea that um, there's also a missing piece of the puzzle here, which is the way uh, Christians remember Jewish Christian relations? And the fact that it's not part of Christian practice to acknowledge or um, repeat or teach to the kids uh, many uh, great uh, crimes against the Jewish people that the Christian church and flock committed through the ages. It's, it's never been understood. It's been considered an improper kind of a you know, demoralizing thing to talk about, so it's not part of Christian practice. What do you think? Right. Um, I was trained as a historian in medieval Jewish Christian relations. <laughs> So this is important to me. Um, I think we can learn from the past. I think I don't think the past repeats itself. I don't think, I disagree, I don't think it's like the 1930s Germany, in part because the United States has much stronger democratic institutions than the Weimar Republic ever had. That doesn't remove the fact that there is a problem and a danger and that things could still go wrong. They're just going to go wrong in an American way. Um, I think context matters a lot. Christians need to talk about the past, their past. The problem is, if you're Protestant, you don't have a past. You just have the scriptural present. Roman Catholicism has a different story about that. Roman Catholicism has done a good job of accounting for its past, if you go to a Catholic school, you will learn about this history. Um, but that's because Catholicism has a different relationship to tradition in the past than Protestantism does. Uh, America doesn't have a past. It has just the future. So I think our way of anti-Semitism probably isn't talking about the past here. And maybe it's a little too meta for you, but uh, that's why I got on the, on one foot, as they say. So, what else we got? Hi. Um, how do we educate our? Excuse me. Yeah. How do we educate our children? Just given the fact that maybe they're not getting this education at home. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we reach the young people of America to make them aware of what is happening? And also learning about history. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, most people don't, most students I've encountered at Boston College know nothing of even the American past. Um, they don't have a deep learning. So I think this is a, a big issue. We're having a debate about you, the teaching of history right now. And I think it's important for us to support public history. I think this is also the place where Working with youth around values perhaps is much more important than anything else. And values in a way of, there are things that are right and there's things that are wrong. And that there are moral judgments to be made that have to be expressed in truth and in love. Because you don't really have love without truth. That's something over here. Let's wait for the mic, though. Oh, I or we got someone else there first. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Hi, right. hi. I just wanted to. Um, I, I was going to say one thing. But I just wanted to thank you so much, and to everyone here who is not of the Jewish faith for being here, because I, I have, I have never been to. I've been to so many programs about anti-Semitism in my entire life. I'm, I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. I have never ever been in a space like this where someone who wasn't Jewish was speaking about anti-Semitism so beautifully and so 
I just wanted to say it's like a very, it's like one of those moving experiences I've had in a temple, and I've been in a temple many times in my life. Um, and I just want to echo one thing that about the conspiracy theories and language, which is I think all of us have heard these in small ways more than we realize. Like, like on the car ride here, we were talking about like when Chris Rock gave his like SNL speech that was just laden with all these throwaway jokes about Jews controlling Hollywood and all these other things. And there's such quick, cheap laughs because they're just so out there. But those are all little pieces that are part of those conspiracy theories. And the more they're sort of out there and unchecked, they just build and they get more powerful. Yeah. And I think the thing that's powerful about that small blue square is that those things circulate in spaces where there aren't Jews, and then they just, you know, exacerbate. So I think one thing that we all can do is really, like, putting the stop on those kind of things. So right. but thank you very much. Thank you. That's very important to me that you said that. I, I just want to follow up on the question I was asked here as well, because you helped me think about this a little bit more. Have teaching about anti-Semitism be part of your anti-discrimination training? And if you belong to a, a, a religious body that mandates that, for people who get trained as leaders, have anti-Semitism tra training part of that. Work to ensure Holocaust edu education happens in your schools. I know there's a movement to build a Holocaust museum by Park Street. Um, support it. Bring your communities there. Bring your youth there. So there's a way, so advocate for the inclusion of dealing with anti-Semitism when the opportunity arises for certain kinds of curricular trainings. It has to be included as a category. The assumption is it's been fixed because we won World War II. And that's just not the case. Hello, yeah. So my name is Hua Wang. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting us here. I'm the co-president of Chinese American Association of Lexington here. I want to switch gear a little bit about the anti-Asian hate. You know, I think uh, this is always there. I mean, at our table, we talked about what are the parallel between ancient anti-Asian hate and anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this has always been there, right, from the Chinese Ex Exclusion Act all the way to current day. But the pandemic brought this to the surface. Yes. And we were very grateful as our community, because I work here as a lecturer Cal. I'm also involved with the National Organization United Chinese Americans. And uh, so at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, right in March and April, it was really the Jewish community come to us. And this is without the invitation they come into us. This is a JC, you know, the Jewish Council of Public Affairs mm -hmm. and the American Jewish Committee coming to us say, we support you, right? Mm -hmm. There should not be this uh, xenophobia all of this, and we're so grateful. So we held the summit of what we call the Summit of Solidarity. So we had with uh, UCA, had with uh, AJC, JCPA, and uh, NAACP. You know, that was we remember the days of those, uh, you know, Floyd and all these other things were happening. And so I feel like it's, we're very grateful for that support. Mm -hmm. And then I think I feel like I'm very happy here today. It's like also at this community level here, right in Lexington, and we definitely looking forward to join forces with everybody here, right? So this is when we come out, we said this is unity against hate. Yeah. And so I wear the blue pin here, right? And uh, we also have something symbolic. We have what we call the yellow whistles. So we've been distributing yellow whistles nationwide. And the idea is uh, the you know, yellow pearls has been used uh, you know, a weapon against us. And now we say yellow is beautiful and yellow stands for we belong here, right? So, so next time, I think when I come, I will bring box the box of yellow whistles. So we're gonna have the blue pinks and we're gonna have the yellow whistles. So thank you. Thank and you. so, yeah, so, you know, so if you'll comment on this anti-Asian hate, it would be very appreciated. Yes, thank you. I, I think that is really, um, to, to see that connection is deep. And, and again, to say this is work of solidarity, of communities showing up for each other, and so it's not a zero-sum game where if one issue is foregrounded, another community loses. So there's a movement back and forth. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, sorry. Thank is you. Is that good? 
Yes. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation. We really need that as Muslims are facing this a lot in the United States as well. Many mosques have been attacked in the yeah. past and um, our, our Muslim kids in general are being targeted a lot in schools and um, colleges. Um, the thing I wanted to ask you was, um, today America believes a lot in freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So how can we, especially our youth right now, they believe a lot in that, that uh, they should have the freedom of speech and they should be able to say whatever they want to and nobody can stop them. So how do we teach them this uh, in correspondence to what you just said? Yes, thank you. Yes, and, and again, uh, Islamophobia is another great evil that we need to combat and deal with. And I'm heartened by the common cause that Islamic and Jewish communities make outside of Christian spaces. I think it's a very healthy and positive thing. So that's very good. So one of the things I've been teaching in a class I'm, uh, I have right now called uh, Anti-Semitism, Racism, and Christian Nationalism is repeating the idea that words have consequences. We, our free speech absolutists in America are, act as if words just go out and nothing happens. Every single mass shooting against Jewish communities that's happened in the past 10 years the shooter has left behind a manifesto, has made it clear that they were radicalized by words that led to bloodshed. And so I think the free speech debate is like our gun debate. You can have that gun and you can say those words, but do you know what happens after? And I think if we can teach our kids about the care for words, which I know is a deep Islamic and Jewish value to talk about the importance of speech and righteous speech and the great evil that slander is. I think that's something that is lost in our culture. Back to Germany. Germany has really stringent free speech laws around anti-Semitism because they dealt with their past. So what is our freedom? I think there's a deep debate happening in America about what freedom actually is. Is it freedom for? Is it freedom from? For whom is freedom extended? And what does that freedom do? So I, I think you're naming a very important thing. Thank you. I frequently find when I speak to Christians and tell them that I find something offensive. A little bit closer. I find frequently Christians are shocked when I tell them that I find something offensive. Yes. Whether it's, you know, being Jude, whether it's when they know that I keep kosher and they don't understand why I don't want to take my grandkids to uh, see Santa. Um, but I want, and, but I feel a responsibility to speak up on those things. But as Jews, what else can we do to effectively work in the anti-Semitism space? I think I want to borrow a page from the anti-racism movement, which is to say the responsibility is with the majority culture. And I'd say it's a specifically Christian burden to deal with anti-Semitism, to create the allyship with Jewish communities. So it's back to connecting the community. So I think, I think the important, like the thing to how how would you amplify your work, is through partnerships with willing allies. Two point four percent, it's good. You need more. Um, as a one of the. Um, members of LICA and the vice president this year and probably the president next year. I yeah, was very that's how it happens. <laughs> I was very struck with your comment that we have 12 hours to make a good response. So I'd like to know what you would think that looks like. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, th th these are sort of things that like freak me out when I like find out about these things. Um, first of all, you have to like be in the spaces where you even know it's going to happen. 
right? So like I'm on Twitter a lot, which is maybe penance for something I did. Um, but you know, if you're in the right kinds of spaces and keyed into the right kind of communities, you will like find out if things are happening. Um, a bigger picture thing is what we knew about what was happening with the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Um, St. Paul's Memorial Church, which is an Episcopal church, was kind of an, that's on the University of Virginia campus, was an organizing point for clergy resistance against it. So the clergy in Charlottesville had a long time to prepare for it and lay out a plan. Um, you have to do some risk assessment. <laughs> this is why liaisoning with your community safety uh, folks is important. Um, I don't know what kinds, this is my question back to you all, is what conversations are communities already having around safety and response? I attended the Episcopal Church in downtown Austin. That was a was on a terrorist, a domestic terrorist list. And so we now have armed security, uh, much like every single Jewish synagogue in the country. So Christians are used to not thinking about risk. Muslims are, Sikhs are, African Americans are, Asian Americans are. But white Christians aren't. <laughs> and so part of it is to Maybe that's an internal Leica conversation, simply about how we're we not just cooperating, but how are we acting in solidarity with each other. And I don't know if there's a gay-straight alliance here, a, a, a human rights commission here in Lexington. I mean, that might be like other just like nodal points of conversation. Um, yeah, so uh, those are a few initial thoughts. Thank you. I'll um, I'll just say I'm happy to stick around. I also live in Arlington, so you can find me. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. Is it working? Thank you all for being here with us tonight, and thank you, Dan for a most enlightening talk. And thank you to those of you who helped make this evening a success, those who helped in the kitchen, who made it possible for us to be here tonight. When we started this effort, we really didn't know where it would lead. But your support and open-heartedness has truly made this evening a success beyond our expectations. We hope you'll continue this journey with us. We invite you to become our allies as we face the daunting challenge of this increasing anti-Semitism. Merriam-Webster defines the term ally as a person or group that provides assistance and support in an ongoing effort or struggle. All oppression is linked. To be an ally is to unite oneself with another, to stand for a person or group that is being targeted and discriminated against. In an alliance, both parties stand to benefit from the connection they share. So I say to you tonight, let's become allies and help protect each other. Again, to quote Deborah Lipstadt, no society no country has tolerated the existence of anti-Semitism and stayed a healthy democracy. That's something to keep in mind. When you're fighting for the welfare of the Jewish community, you're also fighting for the future of democracy. We're not sure what our next steps will be, but we want to capitalize on the energy of tonight's conversation and move toward concrete action. We believe that starting local to develop strategies is the right step at the moment. And we hope that some of you will continue on this journey with us. We've placed sign-ups sheets on the table 
on the tables outside the sanctuary where you can add your name and email if you're interested. We also hope that tonight is truly the inaugural gathering of our communities, the beginning of an ongoing series of gatherings to examine issues and concerns shared by all, regardless of religion, ethnicity, culture, race. We chose to focus on anti-Semitism tonight because this is an ongoing challenge for the Jewish people. Your community can choose to focus on an area that's important to you. We look forward to being invited into your building and being welcomed by your community and continuing our conversations. Now it is my pleasure to ask our senior rabbi, David Lerner, to close tonight's program. Thank you, um, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Terry, our amazing anti-Semitism task force. And thank you, Reverend Jocelyn Simeon-Koski, uh, for your really moving speech. This has been a really powerful evening. I invite you to Actually, and you know what, most of all, thank you for coming, because this doesn't exist without all of you being here. Um, I invite everyone to rise and assume whatever prayerful pose that feels comfortable to you. Creator of all, sustainer of all, thank you for helping us come together in this sacred space. Thank you for bringing us together this evening, reminding each other that we all share the same basic humanity, that we are all created in the image of God, that no matter what our backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, religious or non-religious perspectives, we are all equal, that we are commanded to love and care and treat each other with kindness and that when one of us is threatened we're all threatened so as we come together this evening let us commit to coming together more often to sharing with one another to learning with and from each other and strengthening our relationships as the prophet isaiah taught let us all ascend god's mountain and build that world of peace, beating our swords into plowshares, transforming words of hate into words of love. Amen. Thank you for being here. I hope to see you at Stop and Shop. <laughs>